Hello everyone, this is Lewis again coming to you with the book of Hebrews and we're going into chapter 5 today. Chapter 5 verse 1, I'm going to begin reading immediately. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. The Hebrews writer is now transitioning from what we were talking about in the last chapter about the rest, the Sabbath of God, and also even some elements of the law. And it also taught that in the law, uh, Jesus, the word of God, was manifest in flesh, became the son of God uh, so that he could become a man like us and then understand what we are going through. And now it transitions into, uh, and we, we see that in chapter 4, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. Now it transitions into the, the Hebrews concept of the high priest and where this idea of a high priest comes from. We have a high priest in the law that's of the Aaronic lineage. And then we have uh, another kind of priest, which is alluded to later on, but spoken to spoken to us in, in more depth in chapter 7, which is the order of Melchizedek, which is not a, um, a priesthood under the law and not a priesthood under Aaron, but a, another type of priesthood. And this priesthood is uh, one that is forever only because this particular priest has no beginning of days according to scripture, not, not uh, written anyway, and no end of life according to scripture, having no mother nor father. And so according to scripture, and um, the idea that there's nowhere in scripture that this, this information can be found, it is now chalked up to a mysterious figure. And Melchizedek is such a mysterious figure, but we should not think too highly of Melchizedek as the Hebrews writer is putting all the light on Jesus. Jesus is the one who is in contrast to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a foreshadow of the figure Jesus. And so Melchizedek is inferior to Jesus in that whatever Melchizedek was, Jesus is better. And so we have to continue the line of reasoning and the line of thought that the, the book of Hebrews is actually going by. Therefore, the book uh, Melchizedek is not Jesus himself in the Old Testament. Uh, a lot of people actually believe that. But could be a man that literally had no, no scripture writing about his life. Therefore, he came out of nowhere, but was considered a, a priest of God in Abraham's time and nothing was written of him. Therefore, he had no beginning. So this is one line of thought concerning Melchizedek. Now, I don't want to go into Melchizedek just yet uh, because I might be jumping the gun. So let me not, not even talk about Melchizedek yet. We have chapter all chapter 7 to do that. Uh, so verse 1 talks about the idea of what a high priest is. For every high priest... Doesn't matter what line, doesn't matter what lineage, it doesn't even matter. It, it, it seems to mean that it doesn't even matter what a high priest is according to other religions either. And so think about this. Every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. And so if it's a priest unto Elohim, Yahweh, then things pertaining to Elohim, Yahweh, that priest would be able to usher men to their God, help them, assist them in their humanity, reach the Lord, the, the invisible God. Remember last, last uh, video I mentioned about how God is invisible, but Jesus is God made visible. Therefore, Jesus uh, helps us, you know, see and, and pinpoint a location, you know, a locatable God through himself and so he is in essence a, a, a even better high priest because we don't even have it's not that we have access through a man but we have access from god himself giving him, uh, us access to himself by himself in his flesh that is his veil uh, so um verse one continues it says for the high priest is taken from among men is ordained for men 
So a high priest is not for God. That's uh, number one right there. Even um, even in John, let me uh, actually pull that scripture up because I, I quoted it plenty of times and I think it's good to know where that scripture is. I think it's in Timothy. I, I always get that mixed up. All right. Here we go again, my flubs. <laughs> and that's all right. I'm all right making mistakes. So uh, it's 1 Timothy. It was 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Therefore, when we think about the Son of God... We don't think about God on earth because God did not come to earth to be God. He came to earth to be the son of God. And in being the son of God, he became um, relatable to humanity. And in his relation to humanity, he was able to be the middleman talking to God, the father, and talking to men on this side of the table and bringing the two parties together. And so Jesus is considered the mediator between God and man. Although we know by revelation that Jesus is God. Jesus is the word of God manifest in flesh. Therefore, he is God manifest in flesh. Um, not to be God, but to be a man. And so in being a man, he has become relatable. He is uh, able to suffer the same things we suffer and, un and understand our our um, our infirmities and so now not only uh, is he ordained for men in things pertaining to God but the idea is that it goes further it says in uh, in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins and wasn't this the reason that Jesus came into into uh, earth anyway to save men from their sins, to destroy the works of the devil? Is that not what he what his mission was? And so this is exactly what God came to earth for, becoming a man, and in becoming a man became the son of God. You know, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was indeed the son of God. He indeed came in the flesh. We do not deny that. We do not deny in Jesus coming in the flesh. And we also do not deny Jesus' divinity. But uh, his divinity is hidden in Christ. And again, uh, we, we, we take the idea of, of God hiding in Christ from uh, books as early as Isaiah 45 and 15. Isaiah 45, 15 says, Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. And then he says in verse 19, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. And so he talks about, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come and all the that are incensed against him shall be ashamed and the Lord shall be and shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. And so we see, uh, no, no, here we go. Verse 21, Isaiah 45, 20, tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them counsel together who have declared this from ancient time, who have told it from that time, have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a savior. There is none beside me. So look at verse 21. There is no God beside me, a just God and Savior. Verse 15, Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. And so what, who was born in, in Bethlehem, in Israel? The Savior. The Savior was born to save his people from their sins. And so this is exactly what Jesus has become in becoming a man. He became a high priest among men, and was ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices. Jesus was able to offer gifts and sacrifices unto the Father in himself 
and he himself became the propitiation for the, our sins, not just for the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. And so verse two, who can have compassion on the ignorant? Still talking about a high priest taken from among men of which Jesus was. And on them that are out of the way, we were all out of the way, but Jesus pulled us in. Um, with that, let me just finish that scripture for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And so from men, a man is taken to be a high priest. And so God had to become a man so that from men, this man, Jesus could become a high priest for us and also take on our infirmity. That is take on the likeness of flesh who in the likeness of sinful flesh condemned sin in the flesh. And, and we, now we know the rest of the story. But look at, um, I wanted to read Isaiah 53. And let me see how, how early can I go into that? I mean, pretty much Isaiah 53, the whole chapter. Who have believed the report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord is revealed, meaning seen, manifest. And we see and, and see the manifestation of God's arm in Christ Jesus. So the word of God had a plan. It was Isaiah 53, 1. As that plan bore out in Jesus' life, he lived from Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. Let's read actually what, what happened to Jesus. Uh, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Uh, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. What is he? A man. But what is he specifically? A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and he was we and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. You know, we have griefs too, but he has on board our griefs as well. So this song, this uh, I, this um, this chapter in Isaiah speaks specifically in tandem and in uh, partnership with Hebrews chapter five concerning this this um, high priestly duty in becoming a man. You know, so that he could be taken from among men to be a high priest for us in things pertaining to God. And so, uh, he, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are here. All we like sheep have gone astray. Isn't that what it, it says that we are all out of the way? And on them that are out of the way, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 2. So in Isaiah 53 and 7 says, uh, 53 and 6 says, uh, we have turned everyone to his own way, meaning we're out of our way. <laughs> we're, we're lost. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shivers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? Who shall declare his generation? Generation, how Jesus was generated into this earth. Who's going to declare how this man was generated in this earth? Where did this man come from? And how? who's going to spread the news about how this man came to save us? Who is declaring that this man was generated to begin with? And we know that the, uh, the, uh, the generation of Jesus Christ in Matthew, I think, let, let's look at that real quick. Because when we look at those words, these are not idle words that we should just skip on by. Matthew chapter one, verse one says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus Christ was generated into this earth. How did it happen? He was born of a woman, you know, fathered by the Holy Ghost, he was generated into this earth. He lived an actual life as a human being. Who shall, and Isaiah speaks it, you know, prophetically, who shall declare his generation? Uh, where, where, where was I? Where was I? And about verse eight, 
And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the right rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. This man had no sin in his life. He was a perfect sin sin offering, sin sacrifice, an atonement. And even in Jesus' lifetime, there was a man who prophesied, and I forget the man's name, but I think it was a high priest that prophesied that there was going to be a man who was going to die for the sins of Israel. And so that prophecy actually came to truth in Jesus' lifetime, in Jesus himself. He was the sin offering for the for the sacrifice sin offering for Israel. And he made all, uh, verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, that he, uh, he that hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities therefore will i divide him with a portion with the great divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors see that word intercession this man, he was a man of sorrow. He became a man. The arm of the Lord was revealed. The Lord himself became a man and suffered as a suffering servant unto the very end. Lived a life of perfectness and sinlessness and died for no good reason. But that he was God manifest in flesh and he was rejected of his own brethren. Rejected of men. And so this man, he was, uh, uh, it, it pleased Yahweh, God, the Father, to pour out his indignation on this man for the sacrifice offering for his people that he may bring many sons back unto glory. This is what the Hebrews writer actually says in, uh, verse, in chapter 2, verse 10. He says, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And so, w wait a minute. The, the Trinity, and now I'm going back to the, the idea of Trinity. The Trinity describes the Son of God as being uh, pre-existent, you know, co-existent, co-eternal, just as powerful as the other two parts of the Godhead. And so, why is it that the Son of God was made perfect or made made the captain of their salvation perfect and then we go into today's lesson it says um i, I don't think i got to it yet oh uh, I'm, I'm i'm biting up I'm, I'm going too fast so my mind is already the chapter is already in my head my mind is already there i, I need to i need my mouth to catch up with my mind <laughs> all right so look at this um verse three and by reason hereof he ought as for the people, so also for himself. Talking about, uh, um, talking about the human, you know, regular high priest that for himself offered a sin act, a sacrifice for himself and for the people. Because if he came incorrect, he would die himself and the people would be in sin still. And so, and by reason hereof ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. And so a high priest is called by God, anointed by God, appointed by God, meaning God the Father, to become among men a high priest for men in things pertaining to God. So only God can call a man to be a high priest, therefore the Son of God, Jesus the man who was living on earth, you know, walking in, here and there through Capernaum, Galilee, and, you know, going through the Sea of Galilee and, and off on the coast and all throughout Judea and Israel. I mean, come on now. That man was born in this world to be a man, and he was indeed called by God to be this high priest. 
And this is all made possible because he was the word of God manifest in flesh and called the son of God. This is why the Hebrews writer again talks about another scripture. He revisits a psalm again. It says, uh, verse, in verse 5 says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in the high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, to day have I begotten thee. The day that Jesus Christ was born is the day that he became a man for the first time ever incarnated as a human being. There was no time before or prior according to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 verse 2. Because had the Son of God been in the Old Testament talking to prophets and talking to Moses and talking, then that the Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 2 would be untrue and unreliable. The Hebrews writer is a liar and everything written afterwards cannot be trusted. So what is it that is written in Hebrews 1? We're going to go revisit again. God, who has sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom, had, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. And so this Son is revealed to be the Word of God, by whom God made everything. By whom and from, uh, with whom he has appointed this word of God that was manifest in the flesh that became a son, today, this day have I begotten thee. He became a son. God the Father appointed that man, Jesus, to be a man for Israel, a man for humanity, a man under the lineage of David, a man taken among men to be a high priest for things pertaining to God. He became what he became because God appointed this man to become. And in his becoming, we have become. If it wasn't for Jesus becoming, look at that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14 says, And we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the, thing, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And so we are made or have become partakers of Christ because Christ has become in this world. And so chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. This is, this is the nature of Jesus' life on earth. Everything he did was to glorify the Father in heaven, not to be made revealed as God on earth. I mean, he could have called a, a multitude of angels, a whole bunch of angels to, to fight on his behalf, take him off the cross and, and win it another way. But he did not. And we're going to see why in, in the next couple of verses. And so, again, the Hebrews writer brings up the same idea today. Uh, have I begotten thee? And so it is a specific day as relating to Hebrews chapter one, verse two. He says, in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And then he goes into uh, verse 5 of chapter 1. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten you. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. John 1 and 14 in parentheses says, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. I know I repeated that already. I know I said it. And so continue. Verse 6, as he said also in another place, he's, he goes on into, into uh, his quotations of Psalms. This particular Psalm is found in Psalm 110. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we're not going to go into Melchizedek too much because it's, um, it doesn't, uh, Melchizedek is not relevant yet in this chapter, but will be in chapter 7, as we understand what, cha uh, what, what is meant from the Hebrews writer, he starts to uh, theologically explain what Melchizedek means to him, and what it means in scripture of, you know, the mysterious nature of Melchizedek, and how it points to Jesus Christ, and so we're going to see that later on, and I didn't want to get into it, but if you want to study that beforehand, that's found in Psalm 110 verse 4, and Genesis chapter 14. And even from those scriptures, you won't see very much, you know, written about it. All you can do is infer. 
And David, the prophet, talks about thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. David said that. He prophesied of a historical character who was, you know, mysterious to him, but it was a prophetic utterance of David that he says, thou art a priest forever at the order of Melchizedek, pointing to Jesus and the nature of what Jesus was to become. He was going to be a man taken from among men to become a high priest in things pertaining to God and giving offerings and sacrifices for sins. <laughs> And so, who in the days of his flesh, talking about Melchizedek, when he had offered up prayer... Oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Who in the days of his flesh, talking about Jesus, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong cries and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and, that, and, that, and was heard in that he feared. And so, where's this idea that he heard that he feared? It was because he was in the prayer of Gethsemane. You know, when he went to Gethsemane and prayed before his um, his betrayal, before he was delivered up to the council and delivered up to be crucified, Jesus was seen to be afraid. And he says, not my cup, but uh, let this cup pass away from me. If at all possible, let this cup pass from me. Lord, Father, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. And so this is in direct relationship to Jesus. Though he were a son, Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. In one place it says that he all uh, that he suffered even unto death. Let me see if that's let me see if that is Philippians 2 8. Let's take a quick look. Because I gotta get inside for work. Yes, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And from there, we, we understand that uh, God highly exalted him. Every time we talk about the death of Jesus on the cross, it always talks about no soon after, uh, no soon after uh, that he was also glorified. Even in Isaiah, it talks about how he was numbered with the transgressors, but he was also, um, he, he uh, took up all these spoils and became great. Because of this sacrifice. And so there are, you know, there's things to be said about sacrificing in this lifetime. You know, the things that you sacrifice as unto God, you're going to receive a lot more glory in, in the hereafter for sacrificing for God's sake. And so count it all joy when you suffer. And this is a, another message again, it, go, it all points back to these Christians who were contemplating going back into Judaism. And, and, and denying Jesus Christ and deny everything that they have learned. Um, count it all joy when you suffer these persecutions. Consider it a sacrifice. Be like Jesus and sacrifice your life. Be like Jesus. Um, and also Romans, let's look at that too. That just kind of came to my head. Perhaps somebody is out there suffering something and needs to hear something like this. Chapter, um, I think it's chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, uh, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of his own more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so he talks about how we deal with life and not thinking so highly of ourselves that, you know, Jesus suffered this. Our master suffered this. How much more in this life are we going to suffer? But we have not only Jesus' example of, you know, making it past death. You know, we can make it through anything if we could just get our minds to understand that God conquered death in Christ Jesus. Jesus conquered death through the power of God. How much more through the power of God will God deliver us from any situation underneath death? There's nothing we have not we have not prescribed the surface of what we can what we can really truly be persecuted for. We are uh, we are, I don't think we are uh, in America, I should say in America. We have not truly been uh, delivered unto death for our beliefs. 
Come on now. Come on. This is not how we live in America. We, we, are, we are brats up in here. But when we talk about Christians in China, Christians in Pakistan, and, and places where Muslims rule over them, and they have to keep their, their, their belief in Christ secret, they have to go through symbolic gestures and, and trying to pass, you know, pass off being a Christian. You know, they can't just be openly professing Jesus. Otherwise, they're going to die. And so we don't, we have not yet resisted unto death, as the scriptures say. And so, though he, he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. Now, again, that goes back to the idea. He, uh, he was made the captain of our salvation to make our salvation perfect through his suffering. He was made perfect, meaning he, the, the, what he had become had to mature into what God's plan was indeed the whole point. The whole point was that this man would be delivered to the cross and die for our sins and, and, and fulfill his obedience. That is what is meant by perfection. And so the Son of God was made perfect, meaning that he had to finish something. So he started, but he needed to finish something. So the Son of God was not in pre-existent as a human being before the foundation of the world. No, he wasn't. He was not pre-incarnate, as Hebrews 1 and 1, verse, verse 1 and 2 says. Hebrews 1. And so we continue, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And so what is this gospel that we preach? Shouldn't we obey the gospel? This, this is what it means uh, here. We ought to obey him and continue therein and fulfill our purposes in, our, in the plan that God has in our lives and not faint and not give up and not uh, stop having faith. The minute you stop having faith, the minute is that that, that minute you cut, off, cut yourself off from the grace of God. You must remain in the faith. God's grace is forever. But your faith must remain. God's grace is it goes on and on through Jesus. But if you're not connected to Jesus by faith, then you don't have the connection to his grace. His grace is unfailing, but you have to be connected to it by faith. Eventually, Hebrews talks about this. Eventually, uh, this is what the whole book of Hebrews is all about. Staying. Stay here. Stay here with us. Don't go nowhere. Don't cut yourself off. Woo, Jesus. That, that's, somebody needed that. Verse 10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say. Now, this, this we're still talking about Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, Jesus, though he were a son, Jesus, and being made perfect, he became the author of salvation, Jesus, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus, of whom? Jesus, we have many things to say. And this is a common, common misdirection here. Uh, a lot of people like to take this to go into Melchizedek's direction and, and thinking that we're talking about Melchizedek still. No, he was called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But who was called of God? Jesus. Again, he was made perfect. He was called. He was appointed. He was anointed. This was Jesus, the man. And he became all of these things for us. Of whom, Jesus, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are full of uh, dull of hearing. Now, I'm going to continue later on because I got to get to work. So God bless you all. We, we cover Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And we're going to go back from 11 to 14 again. And so I'll see you later. Bye bye now.